Don't you just love your pastor? Hey, stay up here a second. Try to get away. I was reading the scripture, Caleb. Acts 11, 24, speaking of Barnabas, it says, For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. And I read that yesterday, and the Holy Spirit just highlighted that for you. And uh, you are a man of faith. You are full of the Holy Spirit. But what I see when I travel the body of Christ is there is not very many good men. And your pastor is a good man. We joke around all the time. We're from Sacramento. But we're like, Lord, if the wind blows up here and moves the McCacram family, we would be honored to be at this church. Stretch your hands towards your pastor. Father, we just thank you for Caleb. We just thank you for this mighty man, full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, but is a good man. We just honor him. We thank you that many have been added to the kingdom of this because of this man's faithfulness. And we just say, Lord, like anything, it gets better with age. So we just say, God, more, more, and more in Jesus' name, God. We just say, let the city of Novato, God, bring forth, God, all the sons and daughters. We just call them forth now in Jesus' name, God. We thank you that the earth is groaning for sons and daughters, but God, it's the Holy Spirit has been groaning for healthy fathers. We thank you for a healthy father in this house. We thank you for longevity, long life, and the favor of God to continue to increase in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Ooh, we're just getting started. Um, you know, the beginning of, of 2019, I really felt the Holy Spirit say that 2019 was going to be a year of intimacy. And I just, I just dove into that and thought I knew what that meant, but I had really no idea. And then I started to study a little bit of what intimacy looked like in the Bible. And intimacy is this drawing close to Jesus, so close that you could lay your head on his chest. And you could hear the heartbeat of heaven. John the Beloved, who was John the Revelator, you know, decades later, had such a close proximity to Jesus that he could hear the heartbeat of his Savior. And because of that proximity, he didn't desert Jesus when everybody else deserted Jesus, the disciples left. They're like, peace, see you, Lord. I know we said we'd never leave you, but it looks pretty serious now. <laughs> but John stayed put. John followed him. And when you're that close to Jesus, and John stood at the foot of the cross, Jesus will entrust you with the closest matters of his heart. And John was entrusted with Jesus' mother. And at the foot of the cross, Jesus says, John, here is your mother. Mother, here is your son. And that's what, that's what my prayer is, is that, Jesus, I want to be so close to you that I can hear your heartbeat, but that you could entrust me with the closest matters of your heart. Would you just close your eyes for a moment? Father, I just pray, Lord, that we would be a people of intimacy. God, that we would move into that place, God, where nothing else matters but your presence. That we could hear your voice so clearly, God. Lord, that even our own lives, God, we would be willing to risk them because we want to stay so close to you. That we, God, I just bless this church. I just bless everyone in this room, God. I pray, call them to the covenant of intimacy, Lord, where it just moves past church attendance and serving God, but it becomes the very thing that we center our lives around. So, Father, I bless them now. I just pray, awaken that first love, Lord. Awaken that and bring back to remembrance those encounters that they had with you, Lord. Even the encounters they had driving here, the things that happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even the prayers they gave up praying about God. Lord, I pray, bring that freshness back into their life. Re revive those dreams that have been passed and said, that'll never happen anymore because of this circumstance. God, I pray, Lord, bring it back now in Jesus' Jesus name give them faith to believe God that you are a God that never forgets that you are a God Lord that fulfills all of your promises God and that our prayers there is no expiration date on those but you answer them in Jesus name amen amen so I was uh, so about I don't know who's been praying in here anybody hungry for the Lord in here just kind of wave at me a lot of people okay 
So back in the summer, I was uh, doing what I normally do, and I was just scrolling through my phone, you know, looking at all the news feeds on different social media apps, and the Holy Spirit just speaks to me. He says, Jared, social media has become a distraction to you, and you need to do something about it. And then, you know, I'm like, well, Lord, I have to post about it because I have these things in my life and my family and my ministry. And so then he just was quiet. And I had to make a decision, <laughs> like, what am I going to do? And so I delete, 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 started deleting my apps. And, you know, after about three days, I realized that I started, I started to really look forward to the attention and the applause and the affirmation of men more than my Heavenly Father in Heaven. And while I was seeking the Lord every morning, I couldn't wait to post it so somebody else could say, good word, or wow, fresh fire, fresh revelation, emojis, hearts, hearts, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I would get this revelation, and I would stop and go, Lord, this is from you, just for me, and not for anybody else. And I found myself just receiving the affirmation of heaven. And oh, as he spoke to me in the beginning of the year about intimacy, he found myself, I found myself drawing and being distracted away from him. And he was so kind. He was so kind to just woo me back to that place where it's just the two of us. And I liken it to this is that my dad, he had a heart attack about five years ago. And when we, when we showed up to the hospital, me and my brothers and my mother, and we're uh, just waiting for them. And, you know, medicine now, you know, they were able to put a stent in, remove the blockage. And when we saw him that evening, he comes up and, you know, he's walking and he's smiling. I'm like, Dad, you just had a heart attack for Pete's sakes, you know. I don't know who Pete is, but he has a sake. And so I'm like, Dad. And he said, he goes, son, and I feel like a million bucks. I was... Man, I had no idea that I was living with the blockage for such a long time. I had just been living my life that way. He goes, but now I feel like I can finally breathe again. And the Holy Spirit brought me back to that place five years ago and said, Jared, you were continuing to function. You were continuing to lead in ministry, but you were doing it with the blockage. And I was like, Lord, I don't want to have a blockage. I don't want anything else but you. And so don't do what I did. Do whatever he tells you. And it may look like something else for you. Maybe it looks like putting the bottle away. Maybe it looks like saying no to some TV shows or whatever it is. Whatever that Netflix and all that different things that come against us and steal our attention, steal our affection that he deserves. But whatever that looks like, let the Holy Spirit speak to you today in this service. And as he speaks to you, just be obedient. Because all I can tell you is, oh, I had no idea I was living with the blockage. I had no idea I was functioning that way for such a long time until all of a sudden the free-flowing Spirit of God, it's like all of a sudden the dam broke and the river began to flow so good in my life. And I'm like, I never want to go back. And then, you know, I slowly like tiptoed back into social media. And then the other night my wife's like, you know, you've been posting a lot. And I'm like, delete, delete. So I did. I was like, cut it out. I was like, nope, devil, you ain't getting me. Because the reality is you have two tables every single single morning that you can sit at. You can sit at the table of the Lord or the table of distraction. And you got to choose which table you're going to sit at. And I believe the Lord prepares a table for us every single morning. And man, you can sit there with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as you open up the Word, the Father is there just pointing to how everything in the Old Testament is talking about His Son, Jesus. And then Jesus is pointing everything out that He did and how He fulfilled all the prophecies and that. Don't forget, I am coming back, reminding us of the soon coming King. He was once the Lamb, but now He's the Lion. Then the Holy Spirit is taking the text and illuminating illuminating it and showing the depth of every word of God and how powerful it is. And it's like you take a shovel and one where you thought you unearthed and then there's another revelation and another. And that table is waiting for you every single morning that you can get lost with him, that you can sit there and get fascinated with God again. Just like Ezekiel, the Bible says he saw visions of God. The heavens were open. And after he saw visions of God, he sat seven days like this, astonished. <sighs> Hey, Ezekiel, hey, you want to come? We're going to go get some chicken and watch the game. I have uh, fire. I have uh, wheels. I have uh, sheriff him. I just, uh, 
Zeke, come on, man. It's been four days now. Uh, wheels spinning, lightning, thunder, you know. It's like he sat there. Like, when's the last time you felt that after watching a movie, you know? It's like, no. Like, we can be astonished. We could be found ourselves just being caught up in God and sitting there and just having to take a time out going, whoa, I didn't see that. Wow. And just reminding yourself of how powerful he is. Sometimes we've lost that awe, that wonder, that astonishing feeling. You know, you can only be fascinated so much in a certain, in a, in a day, your body. Like you are only, you have a, a limited capacity to be fascinated. Have you ever binge watched TV shows? Just be honest. Raise your hand. Okay, all right. All right, the rest of you are lying because, you know, okay. We'll pray for you, confession line later. And so if you've noticed, like, you get all excited and you, you watch the first episode and you're like, yes. You watch the second episode and then by the time you hit the third, it's like, I just got to get over this, you know. It's like, just keep going, keep going, keep going. Just finish this season so I can move on with my life. It's because you are limited in how you can be fascinated. It's so true. What if we took the very first part of our day and reserved that to be fascinated with him? And say, God, I just want to take this part. Before I read my emails, before I look at my notifications, before I do anything, I just want to take this time to sit at your table so I can be fascinated with you. I just want to hear your voice. And that quiets the storm and the traffic running through my mind of all of the duties and responsibilities, all of the doctor's appointments, all of the things that I'm having to negotiate and navigate in this season of my life. But if I just sit with you and I listen like Mary listened, intimacy looks like something. It means that while everybody else is busy and distracted, you just sit at his feet and listen. And all of a sudden, the, the voice of the Trinity, you know, people always talk about, ah, I just can't wait for my next divine appointment. You have an appointment with divinity every day. Every day you can sit at his table and just let him speak to you. And the revelation that will pour forth from his mouth. Matthew talks about when Jesus was tempted, he said to the devil, man doesn't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Another translation says that every revelation or every, every word that continually flows from his mouth. Like that's how we live, Right? That's how we live. We have to have fresh revelation, fresh word, fresh manna every single day. The children of Israel were taught that. You know, they couldn't store it up for tomorrow. It's that every day. I recently had a conversation with a friend. I said, how often, you know, is, is God speaking to you? You know, and he's like, man, I don't really know. Like, you know, maybe like once a month I said, listen, I can't live without him speaking to me every single day. I have pushed all my chips in the middle. I have nowhere else to go. I have to hear him speak. Like, it's, it's, he's the air that I breathe, the song that I sing. He's my everything now. I don't have anywhere else to go. In John 6, 66, Jesus was preaching a vampire message. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. And everybody's offended. They're leaving the church. They're taking their kids and their tithe offerings and they're running out. I added that in. And they're like leaving. And then Jesus looks at his closest followers and said, hey, Peter, what about you? You're going to join the crowd and hit the door? And he says, I don't have anywhere else to go, Jesus. You have the real words of eternal life. Where else are we to go? Have you settled that in your heart? There's nowhere else to go. Nowhere else to go. Nowhere else to go. You know, I just want to encourage you to settle that in your heart today. There is no plan B. There is no plan B. We're all in this thing. Whether the rapture comes or not, I was alive to remember that Jesus was coming back in 88, and then it was 89, okay? So I remember that, okay? I remember. I was still hoping, you know, like maybe it'll be 90, but I don't know. But whether he comes back or not, we are in this thing for the long haul, right? We're in this thing, in this thing not just to eventually go to heaven one day, but to bring heaven to earth. That every day the manifest presence of God will go out before us, just like it did in the old covenant through the ark. Guess what? The ark's in us now. And so we are the 
temple of the Holy Spirit, emanating and changing the atmosphere everywhere we go, that you have been strategically placed by God for such a time as this. It's not an accident that you live in this area, attend this church, that are a part, like it's primed, ripe, and ready. Like California is so ripe, like our produce, everybody loves our produce and everything. It's ripe and ready for something else than just produce. It's ready for a revival. It's ready for an awakening. It's ready. Everything that I was just in some training the other week and I had people from all over the Midwest and I told them from California, they thought I was crazy. They're just like, oh my gosh, land of fruits and nuts. And they're just like telling me like you're an earthquake anytime and you're just this this state, you know, is going to be burned up by the Lord. And I said, better not be burned up by the Lord. It's going to catch the fire of the Holy Ghost. That's the only thing that's going to burn up. Those haters over there in the Bible Belt. <laughs> Gotta love them. I'm gonna... I just started preaching, but yeah, anyways. Whatever. Praise the Lord. You guys excited? All right, good. You look excited. I'm gonna show you a couple pictures real quick. People say they're worth like a thousand words, but I brought a hundred thousand words with me. And so uh, this first picture is what my life was about, um, uh, pre-everything. That's a bass. Anybody fishing here? Anybody fishing here? Good. We got some fishermen. You are closer to Jesus than anybody else in this room. <laughs> and that's what I tell my wife all the time. When she's like, you're going fishing again? I said, just trying to be close like the disciples were to Jesus. And Jesus taught them how to fish, throw the net on the right side of the boat, even restoring Peter. It was around fish. I go, it's just it's part of the, our, our inheritance. So um, this is my life. Um, and, you know, I love catching fish, especially big fish. And I caught the fish of a lifetime. You think that one's good? Check this one out. And, um, yeah, just telling you, man, it's going to be a good ride home tonight. And so this is my wife, Candace. And we, uh, this is on our honeymoon. This is on the island of Maui. Uh, we're doing what honeymooners do. You know, we're celebrating. I'm wearing puka shell. Um, during, during this time frame, 98 degrees and Backstreet Boys and NSYNC was in style. You see the frosted tips. I was sporting it. Yeah, really good. And then, uh, you know, my, me and my wife, we had, we got married. We bought a house. I bought a boat. Uh, to do some, like, you know, take her inner tubing, but it just became a fishing boat. Um, we, uh, we just started living the dream, and I was in construction, and uh, very successful, and, you know, everybody on the outside looking in was like, man, Jared, you've got, like, the perfect life, you married a beautiful woman, and, you know, your life looks really full. And while it appeared to be full, and my life was full, my heart was empty. There was a place in my heart that only God can fill and that when you have a call of God on your life, by the way, everyone has a call of God on their life, and while you have a call of God on your life, you can try to run from it and you can fill yourselves with all the things this world can offer. And while it may feel like it's satisfying, you know the next day you're still empty. It does not last. And so I found myself empty, running from the call of God on my life. My wife started to notice how irregular I was and how I wasn't really serving God. I was just attending church with her and she was picking up on, on discrepancies and things weren't right. So she was praying and then all of a sudden the culmination of prayers from my wife, prayers from my parents. On September 18th, 2005, I had a spiritual awakening. I was driving home. Somebody just clapped. Let's do that. Let's all clap together. <laughs> Isn't it awkward only one person claps? As a preacher, you're like, what do we do? All right, so we're going to all clap. So if we try that, if you hear one person clap, just join with them, you know. So, and if nobody's clapping at a good point, I'll go like this, you know. I'll start the clap, okay? We'll do it. Do it together. This is awesome. All right. And so my, uh, I'm driving home from a camping trip, 6 a.m. in the morning on Highway 88. I can still remember the details. I'm in my pickup, my GMC lifted with 35-inch Super Swampers, and I'm driving down the mountain, and I'm looking over at the valley, and I can see what I'm heading home to, and I'm thinking, I've got everything that this world would say would make you successful. I'm, I've achieved the American dream, but I'm empty on the inside. And I said, Jesus, if you're real, and I know that you are. I said, I'll give you my life 100%. None of this one foot in, one foot out business. I'll give you everything. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm signing up for, but I'll give you, I'll give you everything. And in that moment, the first moment of surrender, 
that I had experienced in years and years and years, all of a sudden the presence of God sweeps through my truck and it was like the dam broke and I was crying tears. I could barely drive. I'm like, what is this? You know, I'm like, yes, this is the Lord. And his presence began to melt away the years and years of having a hardened heart. And I felt it and it was like his, my ears all of a sudden opened up and I could hear his voice so clearly. And my wife had bought me a Bible and it was all crusty, like, you know, like never been opened. It's like, you know, broke the seal. And I opened it up. And I started writing. I wrote the date down. And the Holy Spirit said, read this morning, noon, and night. And I began to read the Bible morning, noon, and night. And, you know, I had to fight the voice of opposition in my truck that day. Have you ever had to fight the voice of opposition that tells you don't surrender? Don't do what the preacher's saying. Don't delete those apps. Don't give up the TV show. Don't do this. Don't do that. You don't really need to do all that. And the voice of opposition was in my ear saying you're never going to have fun any fun anymore. You're never going to be popular anymore. You're never going to have this. You think you're getting ready to sign up for the rest of your life to be bored and miserable as a Christian. Woo! Man, isn't it obvious that all he does is lie? And so I said, I'm tired of listening to you. I've been listening to you long enough. And so in that truck, I was born again. I went from darkness into light. And it's very similar to this experience that, they, that this man, he was blind Bartimaeus. That's what he was known as. And as he, the Bible says they came to Jericho and what lingered in the atmosphere from hundreds of years prior was still evident in that in that city. The same thing that brought freedom with the shout, blind Bartimaeus is about to bring freedom with his shout. And when he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You think that the crowd around him was really excited? Yes, blind Bartimaeus, let's go. Let's get you some healing and breakthrough. They're like, quiet. They told him to sh be quiet, to shut up. Sometimes you got to break through free from that crowd around you, man. When you're trying to pursue God, you just got to tell your friends like, hey, that's enough. You're going to have to back up a little bit, all right? This isn't about you anymore. This is about me. And sorry, you're going to stay locked away in your prison, but not me. I'm getting freedom. I'm getting breakthrough. And while I had no crowd around me, the enemy and all his goons were shouting in my ear, don't do it. And I shouted Jesus. And one whisper, one shout of his name sent freedom into my life. And I was set free from all of the things of this world that were pulling me away from God. There was something, the Bible says that Jericho, the name Jericho means the place of fragrance. There was something that blind Bartimaeus smelled when Jesus was walking by. He, could, he couldn't see, but he sensed victory was in the air, and he could sense the fragrance of freedom coming close to him. I wonder what Jesus is going to do for you today. Maybe you came to this church service and you just thought, okay, another guest speaker in October. Okay, all right, well, let's just check the box and then watch the Niners not be undefeated anymore. And so, just kidding. I wasn't a prophet. I'm not a prophet, all right? But maybe you came to church today and you thought it was going to be a normal Sunday. But let me tell you, maybe the fragrance of freedom is in this house today. Maybe Jesus is walking by today. And today could be the day that you surrender everything that you could write down October 20th, 2019. I hope that's the date because that's what's in my mind. The day that I surrendered everything to Jesus. The day I stopped living a duplistic lifestyle. The day that everything else in my life changed. And I finally stopped playing the game one foot in, one foot out. Can I tell you the, the person that you're fooling the most is yourself trying to believe the lies that you can be effective in the kingdom and live with the blockage I'm here to tell you it's time to go all in it's time this is the time that we need more Christians to have an intimacy level with God and the reason why we have to have intimacy is because intimacy leads to an anointing and if you get close to the Lord, he'll give you an anointing to heal the sick, raise the dead, to cast out devils. He will fill you with his power so you can be his bold witnesses. And Jesus, I, I love this story, in, but I'm going all over the place. Pardon me. I love this story in the book of Acts. I wrote it down yesterday. Acts chapter 19, Paul encounters 12 disciples, and he said, Did you not receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? And then I just stopped. And, they, and they, they say, what do you mean, Holy Spirit? We didn't even know there were such a thing. And I thought to myself, what made Paul ask that question? What was the evidence in these disciples' lives that made Paul ask, did you not receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? 
was the evidence that their lives were not overflowing. The goodness of God, the power of God, there was something evidently missing in their lives that Paul had to say, hey, remember the Holy Spirit? You know, this baptism? And they're like, we only know John's baptism. What are you talking about? And the Bible says that they were baptized and then he prayed for them and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They begin to pray in new languages and prophesy. And I think to myself, you know what? Everybody's against California, but you know what? If, we, if we'll just take some ownership and say, okay, there's some places in California that's a little dry, but that doesn't mean that God can't move. It's time for the Holy Spirit to move again. It's time for the Holy Spirit to awaken again. It's time for us just to really embody it and say, God, if we really need a move of your spirit, choose us. Choose us. Because I've, I've been around. You know what I see a lot of times is that it's like Gideon in the wine press. Your pastor mentioned it a couple weeks ago. I was listening to your message. You're a really good preacher. And he's talking about threshing wheat in the wine press. You know what he was doing, Gideon was doing? He was working without the wind. Have we started to work without the wind? Have we gotten so comfortable saying, you know what? It's going to be this way forever. The enemy's got us in all corners. Are we working without the wind? Maybe today is a start that the wind's going to blow freely through this place again. And it's not going to just happen in our church. It's going to happen in our lives. And the overflow is it's going to go into our families, into our work environments, to every sphere of influence that God has given us so that there can be a great awakening. So the Bible Belt naysayers will be like, hey, we heard about the move of God. God in California. Yes, that's right. You heard about the move of God in California because God's not done with California. God's not done with this city. It is ripe for revival and it's going to start not with somebody else, but with you and with me. That's why we're here today. That's why God has called us. That's why we have been strategically placed. That's why we didn't get called to, to Bama, you know, where everybody's a Christian and there's a church on every corner, you know. I'm sorry. If you're from the South, I did not mean to offend you, okay? I, was, I have lots of good friends from the South. Thank you, brother, back there. He's just like, I saw you. I saw you wearing my belt, and it does have a Bible on it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, let's get back to the PowerPoint here. So... Um, after my, my, after we were saved, I was born again. Me and my wife decided to go on a date and celebrate. She's got a new man with a new attitude, and then this happened. We had our first child. Our first child came into the world. Why is everybody laughing? I don't get it. It's you're laughing because what is up with my hair? That's right. An honest man in the house of God. Thank you. I would be laughing too. I do laugh. I go, what was I thinking? Well, okay, my wife is a cosmetologist, and so she was practicing the peanut butter and jelly slice look. She didn't have any more mannequins, so I became her mannequin. So I think she nailed it. I was like, man, babe, that was really good. Perfect amount of jelly and peanut butter right through there. And so God, God, God is good, you know. Hey, marriage is a sacrifice, guys. Marriage is a sacrifice. Praise the Lord. And so... <laughs> So uh, life's good. We've got a little child, and uh, and then uh, you'll see this next photo. Uh, we get called into ministry. I couldn't believe it. You know, I was like, when I said yes to Jesus, I thought I was just going to be a Christian construction worker, and life was going to be good. And all of a sudden, the Lord's like, I'm calling you into ministry. And I was like, No, you're not. And then He's like, Yes, I am. And I'm like, Ah, okay. So we go into ministry, we, me and my wife both graduate from Bible college, we get hired at a church in Elk Grove, California, and we launch this youth ministry, Elevate 678, you'll see this picture, and I still, I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing, why are you guys hiring me? I don't even think I've read the Bible all the way through, but they, they saw something, they saw past the hair, I guess, and then, uh, you know, what's really interesting is like all these kids are now in college, and two of them were just like, you know, friends. I just officiated a wedding for two of those kids that were just friends in the youth group, okay? And so, you know, I, I, I use that line too. I used to tell my mom all the time, I'm like, Mom, I'm just friends. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm having a Bible study. She's like, why are you closing the doors? I was like, well, you know, we're talking about Song of Solomon, tongues and interpretation of tongues, you know? And so, <laughs> it's a joke. Come on, people, lighten up. <laughs> You're going to use it later, I know. All right. And so life was good, life was great, so we decided to celebrate after a good, su successful ministry launch. The hair's changing, less peanut butter. And we go on a date, and then this happened. 
Our second born comes in the world. There's little Judah Michael. Praise the Lord for my son, Judah. Look at those blue eyes. He's so handsome. Thank you. Yeah, clap, please. Thank you, Lord. We're going to do this together, people. We've got this. Yes. If you don't know how to clap, you know, we'll go to a golf match together, and you'll see it's just like everybody together in unison. There's an old song we used to sing. In unity, oh, in unity. Anybody know that? Okay, one person does. We'll do an acapella later together. <laughs> Everything's good. Two sons, all right? And uh, then I was reading the Bible one day. Does anybody read the Bible in here? Anybody read the Bible? Okay, just making sure I'm in the right place. I was reading the Bible day one of these days, and <laughs> man, my brother in the back with your gold chain and your Hawaiian shirt, man, we're going to hang out. We're going to get coffee later, okay? I, I just love you already. And so I was opening the Bible, and as I was reading the Bible, this scripture just jumps off the page. Does anybody have a life verse, a life sentence, something that just marks them? So I was reading this, August 2010, awake, awake, clothe yourself with strength, O arm of the Lord, awake as in days gone by, as in generations of old. And I go to my spiritual mom in Isaiah 51, 9, which happens to be my birth mom, and I said, mom, I need to know what this means. And she goes, honey, let's read it in context. So she reads the whole chapter, and she looks at me, and she goes, I don't know. And I said, thank you, Mom. I love a non-religious answer. She goes, but the Holy Spirit highlighted it, and he'll speak to you. Fast forward a week. We're at the state capitol, and there's a big gathering called The Call, Sacramento. We're there to pray for the ending of abortion and for God to send a revival to America. And so while we were there, Bethel Church is leading worship, and we're just worshiping the Lord. And... Uh, this guy gets up there by the name of Banning Leapshur, and he says, there's, he said, there's two great calls for revival. First, there's a call from God to man, and he quotes a scripture, and then he says, then there's a call that man awakens God to send revival. Isaiah 51, 9, awake, awake, clothe yourself with strength. And my mom's there, and she has like that prophet eye moment like this. She's like, your scripture. And I was like, ah! <laughs> and so I was like, no, I don't hear. I was, I was like, I was done. I was bawling my, you know, the rest of the night. I was just crazy. And then I found myself, like, from that moment on, everything changed. Everything was centered around praying for an awakening, praying for revival. My poor youth kids, I think they got the same message every single week. You know, I put a different label on it, a different title or something. I'm like, 10 keys for God to move in your life. Pray for awakening. That's it. All right. And so, and that's, that's all I did. Because all I knew, it was kind of like it was destined from God. It was that moment that John the Baptist is in the desert eating crickets dipped in honey, you know, living amongst a group of people called the Essenes, and he's just reading the scroll. And all of a sudden, as he's reading the scroll, he realizes, I'm what Isaiah wrote about hundreds of years ago. I am that voice in the wilderness. And he's reading his own story. It's so all of a sudden I read that verse, and not a typical verse, and all of a sudden I'm like, I'm reading my story, that God was marking my life, that I, for the rest of my life, will believe God, that one day, this is my dream, that one day when I have grandchildren, and you're looking at me like, you've already got a couple kids, you're going to have you know, a lot of grandchildren. Yes, I will have grandchildren. There's going to be a bunch of them. And you know what? I'm going to look at my grandchildren one day, I'm going to sit them down, and they're going to look at me, and they're going to sit on my lap, and they're going to say, Papa. Papa, tell us about the days before the great revival. Tell us about what it was like when the, when the hospitals were full and the churches were empty. Papa, 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 tell me again. How did it happen? Papa, tell me again. When everybody started walking in power, nobody was sick anymore. Papa, tell me again when everybody surrendered their lives to Jesus. Papa, tell me again about how the Bible Belt people got offended because it happened in California first. <laughs> Man, you guys are getting the extra credit. This wasn't second service. I just threw that in there. That's the dream I have. And so after I got marked for awakening, me and my wife decided to go on another date. Uh -oh. Catching on. And then this happened. Our third born came into the world. Little Levi Daniel, praise the Lord. 
you know, I have a TV show now, me and my three sons, in case some of you remember that. Go to the History Channel, watch an episode. And so, me and my three sons, we're loving life. Everything's good. Life is, uh, life is full. Our hearts are full. We love God. We're just praying for revival and awakening where we're at. We're serving in a local church. And then I get this, like, Holy Ghost indigestion, you know, that something's not right. Something's about to change. And I'm like, no. I'm okay. I don't need any more change. I got a hair change, a haircut. I'm good. I've got three kids now, three mouths to feed. I'm a youth pastor. No more change. And, and again, the Lord's like, I'm calling you to Southern California to help your brother-in-law start a church. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so here we are moving to Southern California to help my brother-in-law start a church called Fearless LA. We were rowdy. We sold our house. We pushed all our chips in the middle. We're just like, hey, if, you know, here's the thing about faith. It takes faith to believe that all of us, we have the same appointment. All of us are going to stand before God one day. All of us are going to give an account of our lives. And all of us have to believe this, if you are Christian, that it's not your church attendance, your tithing record, or your good deeds that makes you righteous before his sight. That it's simply faith in his son Jesus. Grace and faith alone that when God looks at us, he'll see us through the lens of his sons and we'll be and through his son and we'll be declared righteous in his sight. It takes faith to believe that. Every other religion, you earn your way into heaven, but not Christianity. So it takes faith to believe that. You know what also? It takes faith to continue to follow him because he's going to ask you to do things that are out of your comfort zone. He's going to ask you to do things that stretch you, that does not make sense to the, to the world and its perspective of how you should live your life. There, it's going to ask you to sacrifice. He's going to ask you to do things that don't make logical sense, that may offend your family. But man, I'll tell you, the greatest joy that you'll ever experience on this planet is being obedient to him. Oh, there's no greater joy than being obedient to the Lord. And so we, we moved down to Southern California to help start Fearless LA. And we knew that every great move of God began with the prayer meeting, so we began to pray. And we were praying in this office, and we're old school. We take oil. You know, we, we don't just take, like, a little vial of oil. You know, we've got, like, the, um, the prepper-sized bottle of oil, you know. So, like, we're just pouring it all over the walls, you know, and just anointing every window and crevice. There was a cat in the hallway. We baptized the cat in oil. We're like, it's a holy cat, you know, and everything. <laughs> And so we're like, this is God's ground, you know. And so then we're writing scriptures all over the wall before we paint. I imagine there's scriptures on the floor here in the walls. Yes, okay. You get it, you know. You're like, we're putting the word everywhere. So we're putting the word everywhere. And then in the next, that night we knew that heaven heard us. But we also knew that hell heard us because this was on our doorstep the very next day. Right there, as we open our office door. Oh, hello. Welcome, Matt. Okay, welcome to the city. Uh, this is a pentagram for those that uh, aren't familiar with it. It's used to invoke fear and intimidation. And you know what it did? It did the exact opposite. It actually reminded us of where the devil's place is, which is under our feet. Yes. Come on. That's a good place to clap. And so we had a discussion with the devil, and we said, uh, excuse me. All the power and authority that you once had was stripped when Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. And now that same spirit that rose him from the dead is inside of me. So you have no power. You have no authority. You can suggest a thing or two, but I'm not listening to your lies anymore. So let me just remind you, I read the end of the book, and you're casting the lake of fire for all of eternity. So shut up. And so I just kind of stomped on the devil a little bit, took my wife. We did a little dance, and then we decided to celebrate. We went on a date. And this happened. Our fourthborn came into the world, little A, Ava Grace. Praise the Lord. My wife has somebody she can dress up besides me now. <laughs> we got three men and a little lady now. And life was good. We're, and we're just like, man, we're in the city of angels believing for another great move of God. Believing that what happened in Azusa Street what happened in the Jesus People Movement that my own father was saved in. There's something in the atmosphere during the Jesus People Movement. The man, Lou Engle, who, was a, who started the call, told this story about how there was something in the atmosphere of California during that time that he'd been praying for his brother for two decades. His brother had resisted Christ and just told him he was crazy. He flies into LAX, lands, gets off a plane, walks up to two strangers in the airport and asks them, Hey, do you guys know what time it is? And they look at him and they, they said, it's time to get saved, brother. And he gives his life to the Lord. Can we 
believe the same thing can happen in the city of Novato, that the presence of God would come down and the most resistant person to the kingdom of God would all of a sudden look at their hearts and go, I'm in need of a savior. I need Jesus. I need someone to save me from myself. Can we believe that that could happen? Can we believe that God could do it again? Do you have faith and expectancy that it will happen in your lifetime? That you can have the story of looking at your kids, grandkids, or great-grandkids and telling them, the day it all happened, the day the awakening took place, the day God began to move across California, and they say, so goes California, so goes the nation. That's right. That's what we're believing for. And so um, I was feeling good. We had a little girl, and then um, I get this phone call. And it's from the pastor of the church we left in Elk Grove. And he said, hey, Jay, the wind's blowing. He says, blow Jared back up to Northern California. And I said, that's the wrong wind. I think somebody broke wind. But I'm just going to tell you, we are not coming back up to Northern California, Pastor. We're in L.A., City of Angels, Disneyland, annual passes. We've got the beach, 80-degree weather. We're not going anywhere. And so, you know, he just said, well, I want you to pray because we don't have traffic like they do down there. And I said, good point. So we prayed. <laughs> Here we are relaunching our ministry back in Northern California. And so we came back and we saw a great awakening take place. It was powerful. God began to move by his spirit. It was so awesome. We saw kids that were, uh, that were just like totally transformed with identity issues, substance abuse issues, and they're inviting all their friends because all of a sudden, it's like the woman at the well, they wanted to go see what made this young person change their life. Why are they shining so bright for Jesus? And so me and my wife decided after a great ministry launch that we should probably celebrate. So we went on a date. <laughs> I know, you're like, don't give the guy a gift card, but someone buy this guy a TV. He needs to, like, poor wife, leave her alone. And so... Um, we had a child, another one. <laughs> Our fifth child comes into the world, little Tessa Ray, praise the Lord. Now, if you study biblical numerology, five is the number of grace. And so we're, we're good with grace, okay? We're good. We're hanging out there. Everything's good. And uh, this, this last picture here you'll see is us. One happy family, all five of us. Yes! And uh, everything was good. We're in our, serving in our local church. And then that little indigestion thing started popping up again. I'm like, whoa, come on, leave me alone, Holy Ghost. You know, I've, I can only do so many life transitions before my wife thinks I'm crazy. And uh, then I met this guy. This is Otis Amy, Sacramento State football player. Also uh, played for the 49ers for a couple years and began to tell me about a move of God in the public high schools and colleges through the ministry of FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I said, man, I have been praying for a move of God for close to 10 years now, and I haven't seen anything like this. And he began to show me pictures and show me what God was doing and bringing former and current professional athletes to speak on public high school campuses and kids just coming to Christ by the hundreds. And so um, he said, I want you to pray about joining our team. And I said, uh, you know, I've got a wife and five kids. That's a lot of mouths to feed. And, and I said, well, what is the compensation like? And he goes, we'll match your salary what you're making at your church. And I go, oh, my goodness. This is awesome. I can't, tell, I can't wait to tell my wife. And he goes, but oh, there's one thing. You've got to raise all the money yourself. And I said, I cannot wait to not tell my wife about that. <laughs> and so, uh, lo and behold, we said yes to FCA again. Walking by faith and following God does not make sense to the rest of the world. I should be a senior pastor somewhere because there was lots of those opportunities too with secure salaries and positions. But God said, Jared, the prayers you prayed for oh, almost close to a decade, I'm going to answer through this ministry. And so I'm here to tell you, friends, I've been with FCA now for two and a half years, and we've seen over 4,000 young people give their lives to Christ. Come on. This is what it looks like. This is a typical huddle. We're in a classroom. We're in a theater. We're in a gymnasium. This is one of our favorite speakers, C.J. Solomon, speaking and sharing his testimony, how he got arrested for drug trafficking from Hawaii on a full-ride college scholarship, gives his life to God in prison, and became a gospel preacher after that. Um, this next picture you'll see is us launching our first ever huddle in an elementary school where elementary students, where my children go to school, um, got to hear... Otis Amy shared his testimony, how he made it to the pros, 
but also how he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And what you can't see in this photo on this right side is all the parents that are lined up in the wall wearing 49ers jerseys because they're like, a former 49er? They're like, a kid. Uh, they're, instead of dropping their kids off, they stood in the back waiting for an autograph. They got the gospel. And so, come on. This next and final picture is a picture of two students that gave their lives to the Lord. And those, those are hands of kids responding to Christ at a public school right before school started. And those kids didn't know what a Bible was, didn't know what a devotional was, and we were honored to be able to give them God's word free of charge. And so I'm just so thankful for this call. I'm so thankful for what God is doing. And I have one minute to preach the rest of my message. Are you ready? Okay. Read the scripture with me right here. Acts 14, verses 8 through 10. I'm reading out of the Passion Translation. In Lystra, Paul and Barnabas encountered a man who from birth had never walked, for he was crippled in his feet. He listened carefully to Paul as he preached. All of a sudden, everybody sudden. All of a sudden, Paul discerned that this man had faith in his heart to be healed. Next Next slide. So he shouted, you, in the name of our Lord Jesus, stand up on your feet. And the man instantly jumped to his feet, stood for the very first time in his life, and walked. I came to preach about awakening, and I believe what God has called me today to do for this church for such a time as this is to awaken your expectation that God can do miracles, that God can send a revival, that God will send an awakening, that God will heal your body, that God will save your sons and daughters, that God will save your neighbors, that God will save your coworkers. I'm here to awaken expectation. Worship team, come on the stage. And so... He is going to do it. And I want you to pay attention to this text. What did Paul see in this man that made him, in the middle of his message, call out for a miracle? What did Paul see in that man's eyes? The eyes of expectation. The eyes that believed. That the eyes that, that didn't even say, I need a meeting, Paul, when you're done. No, he was just looking intently. And Paul discerned in his heart. There was something about, you know what? You could change the message that I was preaching today. And guess what? A lot of you did. Because I had something else. I added a bunch and different things. You changed the message by your level of expectancy when you walked in. Some of you came in. You're like, hey, it's another Sunday. Some of you are like, I can't go home unless God moves in my life. I'm not going to be the same than I was when I walked in. It's expectancy. It's believing that God is who he says he is. Believing that God's going to move by his spirit. Believing what he did 2,000 years ago was not a one-time incident. But God is continuing to move by his spirit. Pouring it out on sons and daughters. On all flesh. I remember reading that scripture to my son Noah. And I said, son, isn't this so awesome? God's pouring out his spirit. The Bible says that sons and daughters will prophesy. I go, that's you, son. That's you. And he says, and then you're the old man that dreams dreams? <laughs> I'm not old, son. You better stop that. <laughs> and I said, yes, son. I ask, I am the old man. You know, when you expect God to move, guess what happen? happens? God moves. <laughs> you, whatever you expect, you start to receive. And when you honor God and the Holy Spirit, it just, it just comes. It just comes in waves. And all of a sudden, I, I remember the first time I was, you know, I'm seeking God. And I, I read this scripture, Psalms, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 50 verse 4. And it says, the sovereign Lord has, has given me a word to sustain the weary. He wakens me morning by morning and opens my ears to hear like one being taught. And when I read that scripture, I thought, oh, God, open my ears. Another version says he tunes my ears to hear. And I started to pray into that. I want intimacy with you. But if I'm going to have intimacy with you, I want to know you for real. I want to know your voice, the God of the universe. I want to have encounters like Ezekiel. So I'll sit seven days astonished. I want to get caught up in the heavens as you told John, come up here. I want to come up here. I want to get caught into that experiential realm. I want to sit at the right table. I don't want to be at the table of distraction. I want to be at the table of the Lord where he reveals to me his destiny. And so I just began to pray into that. And I'll never forget the first time God spoke to me. I was, I was on my way to work out in the gym very, very early in the morning and this lady was in this coffee shop and I hear the Holy Spirit say, go in there and pray for her. 
has God ever asked you to do something that's a little bit crazy before, out of your comfort zone? Well, this is my first test. And so I, I, I hear the Holy Spirit. And because I'm a man of faith, I reason with the Holy Spirit and I say, well, I shouldn't go in there and pray for her because my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and I have to take care of this temple. So I go into the gym and I work out. And so I go work out. Now I'm stinky, hot, and sweaty. And I come out. And again, the Holy Spirit's like, go, go pray for that lady. And I'm like, ah. And I just reminded myself, how often did you listen to the enemy, Jared? And where did that lead you? It's time to start taking steps of faith. And be expecting that God's going to move. And so I said, all right, I'm going to try this out, Lord. And so I go and I walk in this coffee shop. And this lady's behind the counter. And I said, ma'am, this is going to sound really crazy. But I felt like God told me to come in here and pray for you. And she said, yep, that's crazy. And I was like, oh, you know, split second. You know, the emotions that flood through your mind. You don't hear God. You're not, God's not real. You're crazy. Next, try that. Never again. And then... But in a split second, with all those thoughts running through my mind, I see these big crocodile tears well up in her eyes. And she said, what's crazy is I've been having headaches. I finally went to the doctor. They did a scan yesterday. I go to the doctor. They do a scan. They find this big tumor on the back of my brain. And I didn't have the courage to tell my husband and children. But I woke up this morning and cried out to God, God, if you're real, have someone pray for me. And here you are. That day, I cried, she cried, we hugged, I prayed a prayer of faith, and I walked out of that coffee shop with so much expectancy that God was going to move, that there was going to be more stories to follow. And if we had 15 services, I'd tell you 100 more. And you know what the Holy Spirit said? He says, I'm looking for a generation that will just say yes to my voice because they're always saying no. And I said, God, I'll always say yes. And so the expectancy level in my life began to rise and rise and rise. So I've been put in all these hard, crazy situations and watching God move. You know what's so fun about this story is that was over 10 years ago. I'm preaching in that same city. A lady walks up to me in between services and says, Hey, Jared, do you remember me? And I said, Were you one of my high school teachers? I just want to ask you for forgiveness right now. And she said, No. I, uh, my name's Stephanie. I was the manager at that coffee shop you prayed for me and I'm like oh my gosh it worked you're alive you know oh man of little faith and <laughs> and I just, I just want to make sure I got the story straight and she's like yeah and so we we talk a bunch we take a selfie that lady is now in a woman's bible study at my mom's house I mean only God could do that like only God could bring that full circle how this all works will you stand with me right now I came to encourage you to awaken expectancy in your hearts that God will do what he said he's going to do. And all he needs is your yes. And maybe, just maybe, in this room, if you just kind of peek around, you could see somebody that's ready to give birth to a miracle right now. You can see it in their eyes, even before the prayer, even before the closing of the message. You could just see it in their eyes, the eyes of faith, the eyes of expectation that God was going to do what he said he's going to do. Would you just close your eyes and lift your hands? Father, I believe that this place is just ready and right for revival. God, revival is not just a one-time act, God, but revival starts every single day. It starts when we go back home today. It starts tomorrow morning. It starts with us moving into the place of intimacy and seeking you. Father, I just pray right now. I pray for an awakening, God. What I experienced so many times, God, even when I was distracted and I was sitting at the wrong table, Father, I pray that they would pull up a chair that, to the right table of the Lord, that they would pull up a chair, God, and sit at the table of destiny. And as their way, as they are on that way to the table, they would not settle for the crumbs of somebody else's conversation, but they would remind themselves that they have a right to sit at the table. And I just hear the Holy Spirit say, saying that you are worthy to sit at the table, that you do not have to cancel or or disqualify yourself because of what's happening in your life. The Lord says, you are loved. You are loved, and I have a seat reserved for you at my table. You come and dine with me. You come and sit with me, and let me share with you the secrets of my heart. And so, Father, I bless those that are feeling 
they're feeling just like, God, you can't use my life. No, he can use your life. He just needs you to surrender all. He needs you to say yes. He needs you to take that step of faith. And I feel like today is one of those milestone markers in your life. I feel like God sent me on assignment here today to awaken expectation in your life because maybe it went dormant. Maybe you had a discouraging situation. Maybe you had a setback and you thought, I can't believe God for anything else like that again. Let me tell you, friend, today is the day. There's no no greater day than the present to start believing God full of faith, full of expectancy for what he's going to do. And maybe there's a prophetic act that you need to do. Maybe you need to go buy a Bible and write somebody's name on it and believe that they're going to come back to Christ. And when they do, you can hand it to them and you can show them on the cover all the days and all the prayers that you prayed for them, all the scriptures you highlighted pouring and praying over their lives saying, I've been waiting for this welcome home celebration. Maybe it's a brother, maybe it's a sister, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a son, maybe it's a daughter. And you can say, here's your Bible. Here, this is the history. This is other prayers. This is me been journaling my life, pouring and believing for this moment. And it's a privilege to welcome you home. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe you need to try to have another baby again. Maybe maybe it's you needing to get back into leadership because you felt you had a bad experience. You said, I can't trust leaders anymore in the church. They always let me down. Let me tell you, friend, God will never let you down. Sometimes you need to get over your hurdle, get over your offense, get over your hurt, and just get back into the flow again. The reason why you're feeling that way is because the spirits flow. You've got a blockage in your life, and it's time to let that thing go. So, Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this room right now. We're going to sing a song here, and as we sing, I want to invite you forward. I feel like there's just a significant moment at the altar right now, a moment where God meets us here. The altar is a sacred place. We exchange wedding vows here. We dedicate children here, and I've had some of the most powerful encounters of the Lord at the altar. As we begin to sing the song, I feel really strongly that part of awakening expectation in our own lives is coming out of our seats and allowing God to meet us here. Pastor Caleb, will you lead us? And as he does, I just want to invite you forward, and I'm going to be praying for you as well. Stepping into expectancy today. Stepping into awakening. Out of your seats and respond at the altar today. Sometimes there's a physical movement that helps us to say, Okay, Lord, stepping into this moment with you. Father, we have come. Sing it with us. Father, we have come to bow down in worship.